The following is a conversation with Elon Musk. He's the CEO of Tesla, SpaceX, Neuralink, and a co-founder of several other companies. This conversation is part of the Artificial Intelligence Podcast. The series includes leading researchers in academia and industry, including CEOs and CTOs of automotive, robotics, AI, and technology companies. This conversation happened after the release of the paper from our group at MIT on driver functional vigilance during use of Tesla's autopilot. The Tesla team reached out to me offering a podcast conversation with Mr. Musk. I accepted with full control of questions I could ask and the choice of what is released publicly. I ended up editing out nothing of substance. I've never spoken with Elon before this conversation, publicly or privately. Neither he nor his companies have any influence on my opinion, nor on the rigor and integrity of the scientific method that I practice in my position at MIT. Tesla has never financially supported my research, and I've never owned a Tesla vehicle. I've never owned Tesla stock. This podcast is not a scientific paper. It is a conversation. I respect Elon as I do all other leaders and engineers I've spoken with. We agree on some things and disagree on others. My goal is always with these conversations is to understand the way the guest sees the world. One particular point of disagreement in this conversation was the extent to which camera-based driver monitoring will improve outcomes and for how long it will remain relevant for AI-assisted driving. As someone who works on and is fascinated by human-centered artificial intelligence, I believe that if implemented and integrated effectively, camera-based driver monitoring is likely to be of benefit in both the short-term and the long-term. In contrast, Elon and Tesla's focus is on the improvement of autopilot such that its statistical safety benefits override any concern of human behavior and psychology. Elon and I may not agree on everything, but I deeply respect the engineering and innovation behind the efforts that he leads. My goal here is to catalyze a rigorous, nuanced, and objective discussion in industry and academia on AI-assisted driving, one that ultimately makes for a safer and better world. And now, here's my conversation with Elon Musk. What was the vision, the dream of Autopilot? when uh, in the beginning, the big picture system level when it was first conceived and started being installed in 2014 in the hardware and the cars. What was the vision, the dream? I wouldn't characterize it as a vision or dream, it's simply that there are obviously two massive revolutions in, in the automobile industry. One is the transition to elect electrification um, and then the other is autonomy. And yeah, it became obvious to me that in the future, any, any car that did not have autonomy uh, would be about as useful as a horse. Which is not to say that there's no use, it's just rare and somewhat idiosyncratic if somebody has a horse at this point. It's just obvious that cars will drive themselves completely. It's just a question of time. And if we did not participate in the autonomy revolution, then our cars would not be useful to people relative to cars that are autonomous. I mean, an autonomous car is arguably worth five to 10 times more than a, not, a car which is not autonomous. In the long term? Depends what you mean by long term, but let's say at least for the next five years, perhaps 10 years. So there are a lot of very interesting design choices with autopilot early on. First is showing on the instrument cluster or in the Model 3 on the center stack display what the combined sensor suite sees. What was the thinking behind that choice? Was there a debate? What was the process? The whole point of the display is to provide a health check on the, the vehicle's perception of reality. So the vehicle's uh, taking in information from a bunch of sensors, primarily cameras, but also radar and ultrasonics, uh, GPS and so forth. And then uh, that that information is then rendered into vector space, uh, and that you know with a bunch of objects with pro with properties like lane lines and traffic lights and other cars, um, and then in vector space that is re-rendered onto a display, so you can confirm whether the car knows what's going on or not. 
by looking out the window. Right. I think that's an extremely powerful thing for people to get an understanding, so to become one with the system and understanding what the system is capable of. Mm -hmm. Now, have you considered showing more? So if we look at the computer vision, you know, like road segmentation, lane detection, vehicle detection, object detection, underlying the system, there is at the edges some uncertainty. Have you considered revealing the parts that the the uncertainty in the system, the sort of probabilities more, associated with with say image recognition or something like that? Yeah. So right now it shows like the vehicles in the vicinity, a very clean, crisp image, and people do confirm that there's a car in front of me, and the mm -hmm. system sees there's a car in front of me, but to help people build an intuition of what computer vision is by showing some of the uncertainty. Well, I think it's, in my car, I always look, look at the sort of the, the debug view. And there's, there's two debug views. Uh, one is augmented vision, uh, where, which I'm sure you've seen, where it's basically we, we draw boxes and labels around objects that are recognized. And then there's uh, what we call the visualizer, which is basically a vector space representation summing up uh, the input from all sensors. That, that doesn't, does not show any pictures, but it shows uh, all of the, it basically shows the cause view of, of, of the world in vector space. Um, but I think this is very difficult for people to, normal people to understand. They would not know what the heck they're looking at. So it's almost an HMI challenge to the current things that are being displayed is optimized for the general public understanding of what the system is yeah. capable of. It's like if you have no idea what how computer vision works or anything, you can still look at the screen and and see if the car knows what's going on. And then if you're, you know, if you're a development engineer or if you're, you know, if you're if you have the development build like I do, then you can see, uh, you know, all the debug information. But those would just be like total gibberish to most people. Right. What's your view on how to best distribute effort? So there's three, I would say, technical aspects of autopilot that are really important. So it's the underlying algorithms, like the neural network architecture, there's the data, so that it's trained on, and then there's the hardware development. There may be others, but so look, algorithm, data, hardware. You, you only have so much money, only have so much time. What do you think is the most important thing to, to uh, allocate resources to? Or do you see it as pretty evenly distributed between those three? We automatically get vast amounts of data because all of our cars have eight external facing cameras and radar and usually 12 ultrasonic sensors, uh, GPS obviously, um, and uh, IMU. And so we, we basically have a fleet that has, uh, and we've got, got about 400,000 cars on the road that have that level of data. Actually, I think you keep quite close track of it, actually. Yes. Yeah, so we're, we're approaching half a million cars on the road that have the full sensor suite. Yeah. Um, this, so this is, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure how many other cars on the road have this sensor suite, but I'd be surprised if it's more than 5,000, which means that we have 99% we have of all the data. So there's this huge um, inflow of data. Absolutely, massive inflow of data. And then we, it's, it's taken us about three years, but now we've finally developed our full self-driving computer, which can process uh, an, an order of magnitude as much as the NVIDIA system that we currently have in the, in the cars. And it's really just a, to use it, you unplug the NVIDIA computer and plug the Tesla computer in, and that's it. And it's, it's a, in fact, we're not even, we're still exploring the boundaries of its capabilities. Uh, but we're able to run the cameras at full frame rate, full resolution, uh, not even crop the images. And uh, it's still got headroom, even on one of the, the systems. So the hard, full, full self-driving computer is really two computers, two systems on a chip that are fully redundant. So you could put a bolt through basically any part of that system and it still works. The redundancy, are they perfect copies of each other or? Yeah. Also, it's purely for redundancy as opposed to an arguing machine kind of architecture where they're both making decisions. This is purely for redundancy. I think of it more like it's, if you have a, a twin engine aircraft, a mm. commercial aircraft, the system will operate best if both systems are operating, but it's, it's capable of operating safely on one. So, but as it is right now, we can just run 
we we haven't even hit the the the, ed, the edge of performance. So but there's no need to actually distribute functionality across both SOCs. We we can actually just run a full duplicate on 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 each one. So you haven't really explored or hit the limit of this. Not yet hit the limit. No. So the magic of deep learning is th that it gets better with data. You said there's a huge inflow of data, but yeah, the thing about driving the really valuable data to learn from is the edge cases. Mm -hmm. So how do you, I mean, I've, I've heard you talk somewhere about uh, autopilot disengagements being an important moment of time yes. to use. Is there other edge cases or perhaps can you speak to those edge cases? What aspects of them might be valuable? Or if you have other ideas, how to discover more and more and more edge cases in driving? Well, there's a lot of things that are learned. There are certainly uh, edge cases where I uh, say somebody's on autopilot and they they take over, um, and then okay that 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 that's a trigger that goes to our system that says okay do they do they take over for convenience or do they take over because the autopilot wasn't working properly? There's also like let's say we're we're trying to figure out what is the optimal spline for traversing an intersection. Right. Um, then then the, the the ones where there are no interventions. And and we uh, are, are the right ones. So you then say, okay, when it looks like this, do the following, and then and the, and and then you get the optimal spline for a complex uh, navigating a, a complex uh, intersection. So that's for this. So there's kind of the common case. Mm -hmm. so you're trying to uh, capture a huge amount of samples of a particular intersection, how when things went right, and then there's the edge case where, not, uh, as you said, not for convenience, but something. Didn't yeah, go exactly somebody, right. Somebody took over. Somebody asserted manual control from autopilot, hmm. and re really, like the way to look at this is view all input as error. If the user had to do input, it does something. All input is error. That's a powerful line to think of it that way, because it may very well be error. But if you want to exit the highway, or if you want to, uh, it's a navigation decision that all autopilot is not currently designed to do. Then the the driver takes over. How do you know yeah, the difference? Yeah, that, that's going to change with Navigate and Autopilot, which we've, we've just released, uh, and and without still confirm. So the navigation, like lane, lane change based, it, it, like asserting control in order to change do, do a lane change or exit a freeway or or do a highway interchange, uh, the vast majority of that will go away with um, the release that just went out. Yeah, so that that I don't think people quite understand how big of a step that is. Yeah, they don't. So if, if you drive the car, then you do. So you still have to keep your hands on the steering wheel currently when it does the automatic mm -hmm. lane change. What are, so there's there's these big leaps through the development of autopilot through its history. And what stands out to you as the big leaps? I would say this one, navigate an autopilot without, uh, confirm, without having to confirm is a huge leap. It is a huge leap. What it it, it also automatically overtakes low cars. So it's it's both navigation um, and seeking the fastest lane. So it'll 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 t you know overtake a slow cause um, and exit the freeway and take highway interchanges and and then uh, we have uh, traffic light re traffic light uh, recognition, which introduced initially as a as a warning. Uh, I mean, on the development version that I'm driving, the car fully fully stops and, and goes at traffic lights. So those are the steps, right? You've just mentioned something, sort of inkling of a step towards full autonomy. Mm -hmm. What would you say are the biggest technological roadblocks to full self-driving? Actually, I don't think, I think we just, the full self-driving computer that we just, uh, that the, te the Tesla, what we call the FSD computer, uh, that, that's uh, now in production. Uh, so if you order uh, any Model S or X or any Model 3 that has the full self-driving package, you'll get the FSD computer. That that was that's important uh, to have enough uh, base computation. Uh, then refining the neural net and the control software, uh, which but all of that can just be provided as an over-the-air update. The thing that's really profound, and what I'll be emphasizing at the uh, sort of what that investor day that we're having focused on autonomy is that the cars currently being produced or the hardware currently being produced is capable of full self-driving. 
But capable is an interesting word because mm -hmm. um, like the hardware is. Yeah, the hardware. And as we refine the software, it, the capabilities will increase dramatically. Um, and then the reliability will increase dramatically, and then it will receive regulatory approval. So essentially, buying a car today is an investment in the future. You're, you're essentially buying a, a car. You're, you're buying, the, 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 I think the most profound thing is that if you buy a Tesla today, I believe you are buying an appreciating asset, not a depreciating asset. So that's a really important statement there, because if hardware is capable enough, that's the hard thing to upgrade, Yes, usually. Exactly. So then the rest is a software problem. Yes, I've, software has like no marginal cost, really. But what's your intuition on the software side? How hard are the remaining steps to to get it to where, uh, you know, uh, the, the experience, uh, not just the safety, but the mm -hmm. full experience is something that people would uh, enjoy? I think people enjoy it very much. So on on, any, on the highways, it's it's a total game changer for quality of life, for using, you know, Tesla autopilot on the highways. Uh, so it's really just extending that functionality to city streets, adding in the, the traffic light traffic light recognition, uh, navigating complex intersections, and um, and, and then uh, being able to navigate complicated parking lots so the car can. Uh, exit a parking space and come and find you, even if it's in a, a complete maze of a parking lot. And uh, and and then if and then you can just it can just drop you off and find a parking spot by itself. Yeah, in terms of enjoyability and something that people would uh, would actually find a lot of use from the parking lot is a, is a really you know it's it's rich of annoyance when you have to do it manually. So there's a lot of benefit to be gained from automation there. So let me start injecting the human into this discussion a little bit. Uh, so let's talk, talk about full autonomy. If you look at the current level four vehicles being tested on road, like Waymo and so on, they're only technically autonomous. They're really level two systems with just a different design philosophy because there's always a safety driver in almost all cases and they're monitoring the system. Right. Do you see Tesla's full self-driving as still for a time to come requiring supervision of the, the human being. So its capabilities are powerful enough to drive, but nevertheless requires a human to still be supervising just like a safety driver is in a other fully autonomous vehicles. I think it'll, it'll require detecting hands on wheel for at least uh, six months or something like that from here. Really, it's a question of like, from a regulatory standpoint, uh, what, how much safer than a person does autopilot need to be for it to, to be okay to not monitor the car? You know, and and this is a, a debate that one can have. And, and then, if you, but you need you need a, a, a large sample, a large amount of data, um, so that you can prove with high confidence, statistically speaking, that the car is dramatically safer than a person. Um, and that adding in the person monitoring does not materially affect the safety. So it might need to be like two or 300% safer than a person. And how do you prove that? Incidents per mile. Incidents per mile. Yeah. So crashes and fatalities. So, yeah, I mean, fatalities would be a factor, but there, there are just not enough fatalities to be statistically significant uh, at scale. But there are enough crashes you know, there are much far more crashes than there are fatalities. So you can assess what is the probability of uh, of a crash. That then there's an, another step, which is probability of injury, then probability of permanent injury, then probability of death, and all of those need to be uh, much better than a person uh, by at least perhaps two hundred percent. And you think there's a the ability to have a healthy discourse with the regulatory bodies on this topic? I mean, th th there's no question that um, the, uh, regulators pay dis disproportionate amount of, to, of attention to that which generates press. This is just an objective fact. Um, and Tesla generates a lot of press. So the, you know, in the United States, there's 
I think almost 40,000 automotive deaths per year. Uh, but if there are four in Tesla, they'll probably receive a thousand times more press than anyone else. So the, the psychology of that is actually fascinating. I don't think we'll have enough time to talk about that, but I'd, I have to talk to you about the human side of things. So myself and our team at MIT recently released a paper on functional vigilance of drivers while using autopilot. This is work we've been doing since autopilot was first released publicly over three years ago, mm -hmm. collecting video of driver faces and driver body. So I saw that you tweeted a quote from the abstract, so I can at least uh, guess that you've glanced at it. Yeah, right. Can I talk you through what we found? Sure. Okay, so it appears that in the data that we've collected, that drivers are maintaining functional vigilance such that we're looking at 18,000 disengagements from autopilot, 18,900, and annotating, were they able to take over control in a timely manner? So they were there present looking at the road uh, to take over control. Okay, so this uh, goes against what, what many would predict from the body of literature on vigilance with automation. Now the question is, do you think these results hold across the broader population? So ours is just a small subset. Do you think, uh, one of the criticism is that, you know, there's a small minority of drivers that may be highly responsible where their vigilance decrement would increase with autopilot use. I, I think this is all really gonna be swept. I, I mean, the, the system's improving so much, so fast, that this is gonna be a moot point very soon where vigilance is, like if something's many times safer than a person, then adding a person uh, does, the, the, the effect on safety is, is limited. Um, and in fact, uh, it could be negative. That's really interesting. So the, uh, the, so, so the fact that a, a human may, some percent of the population may uh, exhibit a vigilance decrement will not affect the overall statistics numbers of safety. No, in fact, I think it, it will become uh, very, very quickly, maybe even towards the end of this year, but I'd say I'd be shocked if it's not next year at the latest, that um, having, the pers having a human intervene will decrease safety. Decrease. Uh, it's, it's like imagine if you're in an elevator. Now it used to be that there were elevator operators. Um, and and you, you couldn't go in an elevator by yourself and, and work the, the lever to move between floors. Um, and now uh, nobody wants an elevator operator because the automated elevator that stops the floors is much safer than the elevator operator. And in fact, it would be quite dangerous to have someone with a lever that can move the elevator between floors. So that's a, that's a really powerful statement and a really interesting one. Uh, but I also have to ask from a user experience and from a safety perspective, one of the passions for me algorithmically is uh, camera-based detection of, uh, of just sensing the human, but detecting what the driver is looking at, cognitive load, body pose. On the computer vision side, that's a fascinating problem, but do you, th and there's many in industry who believe you have to have camera-based driver monitoring. Do you think there is, could be benefit gained from driver monitoring? If you have a system that's, that's, at or, that's at or below uh, human level reliability, then driver monitoring makes sense. But if, if your system is dramatically better, more reliable than, than a human, then driver monitoring, monitoring is not, does not help much. And uh, like I said, you, you just like as an, you wouldn't want someone into, like you wouldn't want someone in the elevator, if you're, if you're in an elevator, do you really want someone with a big lever, some, some random person operating an elevator between floors? They, they could, I wouldn't trust that. Or I'd rather have the buttons. Okay, you're optimistic about the pace of improvement of the system, now from what you've seen with the full self-driving car, computer. The rate of improvement is exponential. So one, one of the other very interesting design choices early on that, that connects to this is the operational design domain of autopilot. So where autopilot is able to be turned on the so contrast another vehicle system that we're studying is the Cadillac Super Cruise system. That's in terms of ODD, very constrained to particular kinds of highways, well mapped, tested, 
but it's much narrower than the ODD of Tesla vehicles. Mm -hmm. What's there's there's pros like and ADD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's good. That's a, <laughs> that's a good line. Uh, <laughs> what was the design decision? Uh, what in that different philosophy of thinking? Where so there's pros and cons. What we see with uh, a, a wide ODD is drive, Tesla drivers are able to explore more the limitations of the system, at least early on. And they understand together with the instrument cluster display, they start to understand what are the capabilities. So that's a benefit. The con is you're, go, you're letting drivers use it basically anywhere. Uh, so, so anywhere that, that it can, can detect lanes with confidence. Lanes. Was there a philosophy uh, design decisions that were challenging that were being made there? Or from the very beginning, was that uh, done on purpose with intent? Well, I mean, I think it's, frankly, it's pretty crazy giving letting people drive a two ton death machine manually. Uh, that's crazy. Like, I get, like in the future, people will be like, I, I can't believe anyone was just allowed to drive one of these two ton death machines and they could just drive wherever they wanted. Just like elevators, you just like, move the elevator with that lever wherever you want. It can stop at halfway between floors if you want. It's pretty crazy. So it, it's going to seem like a mad thing in the future that people were driving cars. So I have a bunch of questions about the human psychology, about behavior and so on. That matter. would become mute. That, yeah, that moot, totally moot. moot uh, yeah. Because uh, you have faith in the AI system. Uh, not faith, but uh, the both on the hardware side and the deep learning approach of learning from data will make it just far safer than humans. Yeah, exactly. Recently, there are a few hackers who uh, tricked Autopilot to act in unexpected ways with adversarial examples. Mm -hmm. So we all know that neural network systems are very sensitive to minor disturbances to these adversarial examples on input. Do you think it's possible to defend against something like this for oh, the yeah, broader no for the industry? Sure. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you elaborate on the on the confidence behind that answer? Um well the you know, a neural net is just like basically a bunch of mat matrix math. Uh, you have to be like a very sophisticated somebody who really understands neural nets and like basically reverse engineer how the matrix is being built and then create a, a little thing that's just exactly um, causes the matrix math to be slightly off. But it's very easy to then block it, block that by, by having basically anti -re negative recognition. It's like if you if the system sees something that looks like a matrix hack, uh, exclude it. It's, so, it's such an easy thing to do. So learn both on the the valid data and the invalid data. So basically learn on the adversarial examples to be able to exclude them. Yeah, you, like you basically want to both know what is what is a car and what is definitely not a car. And you, you train for this is a car and this is definitely not a car. Those are two different things. People have no idea how neural nets really. They probably think neural nets involves like, you know, fishing net or something. <laughs> uh. So as you know, so taking a step beyond just Tesla and autopilot, uh, current deep learning approaches still seem in some ways to be far from general intelligence systems. Do you think the current approaches will take us to general intelligence or do totally new ideas need to be invented? I think we're missing a few key ideas for general intelligence, general artificial general intelligence. But it's going to be upon us very quickly. And then we'll need to figure out what shall we do if we even have that choice. But, but it's, it's amazing how people can't differentiate between, say, the narrow AI that, you know, allows a car to figure out what a lane line is and, and, and you know, and navigate streets versus general intelligence. Like these are just very different things. Like your toaster and a, and your computer are both machines, but one's much more sophisticated than another. You're confident with Tesla you can create the world's best toaster. The uh, world's best toaster, yes. The world's best self-driving. I'm, I, yes. I, to, to me, right now, this seems game, set, match. 
I don't. I mean, that's how, I don't want to be complacent or overconfident, but it, that's what it appears. That is just literally what it, how it appears right now. I could be wrong, but it appears to be the case that Tesla is vastly ahead of everyone. Do you think we will ever create an AI system that we can love and loves us back in a deep, meaningful way, like in the movie Her? I think AI will be capable of convincing you to fall in love with it very well. And that's different than us humans? You know, we start getting into a metaphysical question of like, do emotions and thoughts exist in a different realm than the physical? And maybe they do, maybe they don't, I don't know. But but from a physics standpoint, I tend to think I tend to think of things, you know, like physics was my main sort of training, and wow. and, and from a physics standpoint, essentially, if if it loves you in a way that is that you can't tell whether it's real or not, it is real. It's a physics view of love. Yeah. <laughs> if there's no if you if the, if you cannot just if you cannot prove that it does not, if there's no test that you can apply that would make it make allow you to tell the difference, then there is no difference. Right, and it's similar to uh, seeing our world as simulation. There may not be a test to tell the difference between what the real world and yes. the simulation, and therefore, from a physics perspective, it might as well be the same thing. Yes, it, and there may be ways to test whether it's a simulation. There might be, I'm not saying there aren't, but you could certainly imagine that a simulation could could correct that once an entity in the simulation found a way to detect the simulation, it could either restart, the, you know, pause the simulation, or start a new simulation, or do one of any other things that then corrects for that error. So when maybe you or somebody else creates an AGI system, and you get to ask her one question, what would that question be? What's outside the simulation? Elon, thank you so much for talking today. It was a pleasure. All right, thank you.